Welcome to Reimagining Liberty, a show about the emancipatory and cosmopolitan case for radical social, political, and economic freedom. I'm Aaron Ross Powell. In a series of essays on my website, I've been setting out the case for goodwill and what I call sympathetic joy within the liberal project. These virtues not only strengthen liberalism, but help us to be happier and more content within a diverse and dynamic liberal society. I haven't discussed this much on the podcast so far, and so I was happy that my friend Peter Betke, a university professor of economics and philosophy at George Mason University, gave me an excuse to do so by raising some critiques of my arguments. I've brought him on today to talk about the liberal virtues, goodwill and toleration, and the values liberal citizens should have. I'll start with the short version of my argument for the liberal virtues and what I'm calling liberalism and goodwill or sympathetic joy. And it goes something like this. Liberalism, political liberalism, is a set of institutions. It's a set of laws governing what the state can and can't do, the institutions that carry out the state's actions or or circumscribe its powers, but ultimately it's all backed up by the people. And so in order for a liberal society to persist, the people need to some degree to want it to. If enough of them decide they don't want liberalism anymore, liberalism is going to backslide and ultimately potentially fail. And what that means is that the people need to possess a a certain set of attitudes about a liberal society, their place in it, and in particular, the people who they share that society with. And a lot of us have, you know, the the thing that comes along with liberalism is people getting up to all sorts of different things. It's a liberal society is dynamic. It's diverse. There are people living wildly different types of lives, pursuing different senses of what the good is, different cultural preferences, et cetera, et cetera. And part of being a liberal citizen is accepting that. If, if you think that there's only one proper way to live and that the state ought to force people to live in that way, then you are like definitionally not a liberal and not a good liberal citizen. I don't think there's anything controversial about what I just said in a descriptive sense, uh, but I think where my argument takes it a step further, and I think this gets to where you and I have maybe some differences or you have a different slant on things, is to say toleration is, is necessary for a liberal society to persist. So if you're up to weird things off in Northern Virginia, I can be intolerant of those, in which case chances are I'm going to want to stop you from doing it. I'm going to want the state to intercede and so on. Um, But if I'm tolerant of them, if I'm accepting of them, then we can kind of each get along with our lives. But for most of us, there is a, a degree of difference beyond which we are kind of not willing to go. If what you're up to is is particularly anathema to my tastes and preferences, it's going to be harder for me to tolerate it. And so while toleration is like a floor for how we should interact with each other and interact with dynamism and difference, if we can go beyond toleration, it strengthens liberalism's defenses against calls to crack down on difference. And so what I mean by that is if what you're doing is something that I merely tolerate, then it's not very – I don't have very far to go from toleration to no longer wanting to allow you to do it. But if instead I can cultivate an attitude of what I call sympathetic joy in what you're doing. So what you're doing may be weird, but you seem to be enjoying it a lot, getting a lot out of it, living a thriving life. It's not what I would choose, but I'm going to like actually take delight or find joy in your ability to find your own kind of happiness. That's like a step beyond toleration. Now, it's not merely I'm willing to put up with it, but your ability to do it is a portion of my own thriving in my life. And so if we can develop this 
what I call sympathetic joy, or just like this attitude of goodwill towards each other that makes it harder for liberalism to slip into a liberalism. And on the flip side, or, or the corollary, I suppose, of it is if you live in a dynamic society and a diverse society, you're going to be surrounded by difference. And if your attitude towards that difference is merely toler is like grudging toleration, I don't like what all these people are up to, but I'm going to put up with it you're less likely to be happy in a diverse society than if instead you can kind of take delight in the difference. And so these two things feed into each other, that you will be, if you can cultivate attitudes of goodwill and sympathetic joy towards others, you will be happier in a liberal society. And that will make you more likely to protect a liberal society, to want to maintain it, and it means that you have farther to slide backwards to get to calling for genuine a liberalism. So it's a, it's a feedback loop of these virtues make us happier in a liberal society and they also strengthen a liberal society. And so I think that's the – I'll link to in the show notes the longer version of the argument and some essays I wrote, but that's the short version of it. So where do you differ from me on that? So I should start out by, uh, you know, my general agreement um, with your position in terms of a personal um, cultivation of a sensibility that I think that liberal intellectuals should cultivate among other intellectuals, um, uh, which is one to recognize and to celebrate the wonderment of human diversity and to respect uh, the autonomy of individuals and their projects and plans in society. The, the issue is, is that not everyone in society, we're not designing a society for liberal intellectuals. <laughs> we're designing a society for ordinary individuals across the board. And the question has always been to me is that what we want to have is we want to have general rules which allow us to live together with the minimum requirement that everyone think or share my sensibilities, okay? Now, this is similar to, you know, why would some people want to live in a city versus wanting to live in the country, right, or, or anything like that. I mean, <clears throat> uh, uh, many, many years ago, I remember reading a, a book uh, uh, by Peter Berger, and he was uh, uh, talking a, about uh, this um, idea from uh, Gellner uh, about uh, uh, basically – uh, what makes up civil society? I don't know if you're a, this is a, a big issue in the 1990s as we were rethinking, uh, you know, uh, transition societies and forming new democratic orders and, you know, what would make up civil society. One of the things that Peter Berger, you know,'s comment was is that, you know, th there are those who live in cities who wake up every day and, you know, they, they see the rabbi walk by and then they, you know, walk down one block and they see the priests hanging out. And then, you know, they, they, you know, pass the, the Muslim, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, temple or whatever. And, 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 you know, and they're all like, Hey, you know, that's life. You know, it's, it's cool. Like, you know, this is where I live. That's very jarring, let's say to someone who's in the middle of Idaho Right. And that kind of thing. And I think that part of a liberal society is one that is one that someone in Idaho is just as comfortable as someone in New York or Los Angeles or Chicago. And we would have these kind of sensibilities. And so the toleration standard, the idea of modus vivendi, live and let live, is the way in which we reconcile our conflicts with one another and to demand more of our political order, not our friends, not our intimate associates, not our, uh, you know, family members, you know, is, you know, you're, you were, we were just talking before the show, you're, you know, you're involved in, in raising kids. I, you know, uh, went through that and now I'm going to be a grandpa and all that stuff. And, you know, what would I want the values to be reflected in my family and everything like that? It would be one of celebrating human diversity of respect of individuals autonomy uh, to have what you call uh, sort of sympathetic joy of, of, of allowing uh, uh, and seeing individuals be able to be their authentic selves and say like, okay, that's like, you know, how life should be. But I don't know if that can be a political theory. I think it can be a personal adaptation 
And so the way that I like to think about this is that we have parochial values, because one of the things about a liberal society is we're going to actually have people in that liberal society who are going to hold on to values that are radically different than ours. And maybe they're like, you know, some, you know, tradition, what might be called now traditional values that they want to hold. And the question is, is where do they fit in society? And my view has always been is that you can have parochialism, but what you can't have is parochialism at the highest levels of your theory. You have to have at your highest levels of your theory, the most cosmopolitan virtues. But at the local level, you can have spot for more parochialism, which could include people who do not celebrate, you know, what's going on in other areas, but as long as they don't intervene. Now, you asked a very, you snuck a, a, a good point in there, which is you're telling a kind of a, not a slippery slope, but a kind of a, a lack of robustness in the defense of the liberal order, if all I care about is toleration, because it's a very thin, a thin idea, right? And I guess that the flip side of that is we also have to have what notion of harm that we have, you know? So if we have a very, you know, kind of uh, non-resilient notion of harm, then people are going to be more likely to want to stop other people from doing things. But if we have a more kind of robust notion of harm, then all of a sudden they have less justification to want to intervene, even though they don't like what's going on down the street. And a similar kind of thing with the notion of coercion. You know, like if, if more and more people are, it's, it's a free choice, then, and we have a broader notion of that, I think then that gives less weight to the idea that you should violate someone's freedom of choice um, in order to do things. And so I think that a lot turns on degrees of, uh, uh, of uh, you know, basically how serious we take these concepts, okay? And so I think that for a political theory, we want to have the minimum amount of adoption of our values by other people in order for us to be able to just agree on a general rule about the way we interact with each other rather than specific content. However, in our personal interactions, our law, our, our associations with others, we might want to associate with people that have a much more shared understanding of liberal virtues. You know, I, I read Steve Macedo's book when I was a kid. <laughs> And I was, you know, blown away by it, the liberal virtues book, you know, was, and I, 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 you know, I thought the world of it, um, mainly because he made a very million argument about, you know, we need to give individuals the freedom to have the smorgasbord of life in front of them, right? And in many ways, you're saying the same thing. So I don't disagree in that sense with that case. I think it's, it's the strongest. You know, it's it's the mill case uh, that we want to we want to celebrate. That's how we we value liberty is because of that. The question is whether or not we have to have everyone agree to that kind of level of attitudes towards others in order to see the kind of society we want to have. Let me let me say one last thing on this, uh, if it makes any sense. And this is where the economist maybe kicks in all the time for me, which is that. Um, you know, the greater the social distance between people, the greater the gains from trade, right? Because I'm, I'm gaining, you know, greater benefits that I otherwise wouldn't have had in my own little isolated world. On the other hand, the greater the social distance, the more difficult to engage in the exchange because it's, it's almost like we're speaking different languages. The transaction costs are too high. And so we have to find some way in which our institutions allow us to realize those gains from trade while at the same time not prohibitively being costly for us to engage in that. It's a magic trick to say, oh, I'll just, <laughs> to me, it would be a magic trick to just say, let's just assume everyone values, you know, human diversity, as opposed to what can I find? And so to me, the toleration argument, the toleration argument is key because it goes all the way back to the religious wars. And it didn't require a Protestant to convert to Catholicism, right? It just required that the Protestant didn't want to, you know, or the Catholic didn't want to put the Protestant in jail or whatever. And and I think that that we learn a lot from that. Does that make sense? I don't, I you know, yeah. Yeah. So there's a lot of really interesting points that you raised and 
So let me pick let me pick one to ask about first, which is you distinguish between the values that we ought to have at the individual family, immediate social circles, maybe even cultural level and and then the values or principles of our political institutions. So you said, you know, what what like I am arguing is is great at this kind of individual personal ethics level, but let it's me be, not let me be even more more blunt about this. Sure. I'd rather have a beer with you than I would with a person that found, you know, uh, pride parades to be something that you need to like, you know, hate or mock or whatever like that. So, you know, I'd want to go and have, you know, sit down and drink a beer with you and, and talk about like the world rather than that. But all I want to do for the pride parade issue is have someone say it's OK. They have the parade, even though they might not like what's going on in the parade or anything like that. But OK, they're having the parade. And then they go and be their like little, you know, upset self somewhere alone, <laughs> but they don't have any political power. That That's the basic, yeah. So I guess then the question is, how do we distinguish kinds of institutions in this kind of normative way that you're approaching it? And what I mean by that is, especially in a in a democratic system, the people themselves, because they they vote their their beliefs and values through whatever decision making processes we have, manifest themselves. At least I'm in in an ideal sense, um, they manifest themselves in the governing institutions. It seems like the people themselves are, and the culture and their values and belief systems are a political institution in a democracy in a way that, like in a a flat out autocracy, it really doesn't matter what the values of the people are. It's just the values of the ruler. Um, and and so can we draw a clear line between these are the rules, principles, values of the governing institutions and these are the rules, principles, values of the people? So the way I would – I mean my argument is really a Hayekian one, which is in a liberal plural society – we have uh, so many different value scales, each of us. Um, and therefore, the only thing that we can agree on, since we can't agree on ultimate values, is the only thing we can agree on is the rules under which we interact with each other. And so, and those have to be the most general uh, that we agree on. And so it's that kind of thought experiment that I back out and defend toleration as the key idea, rather than the idea of any kind of joyous celebration like that that's basically the bottom line here though i think that as individuals we should cultivate among our students among our family everything like that an appreciation for the fact that human diversity throws up so many exciting opportunities for individuals and that they should look at those various different experiments in living as possibilities and you know um, in my book, uh, The Struggle for a Better World, I, I, when I get to the issue about reconstructing uh, liberalism, which is a, an essay um, in there, I, I make this distinction between the right to say no, which some libertarian philosophers have stressed, which I think makes sense, right? I mean, that is a very important aspect of human struggle for freedom is to say no to authority telling you you have to do X, Y, and Z. But I stress in there also the opportunity to say yes. It's very much in your spirit. Say yes to these opportunities of wanting to trade with people that previously no one thought you should trade with, from learning from people that previously they thought, you know, you have nothing to learn from them. Um, they're first movers. They're social entrepreneurs as social change agents, right? And so we can learn from that as well. And the liberal society should be one that celebrates that learning from the great tapestry of human diversity. However, um, I'm, I'm not sure that that's what I can hook a societal thing on, right? That, that's, that's my main concern because I think it requires too much, uh, it would require too much agreement. Um, let me push it even further. So one of the things that, um, that, uh, uh, I mean, this this is insider baseball to libertarianism. So it, it's it's more like your old show and now your new show in in some kind of you know nanosecond squeezed together. Um, 
what was Rothbard's strategy for liberty? Right. There used to be a, a um, you know, a meme, uh, like a cartoon meme, and it had a guy running around with a copy of Man, Economy, and State, and he was beating other people over the head with it. And if everyone, you know, so in some sense, Rothbard had a truism at the end of the day, which was, is everyone is a libertarian, we'd live in a libertarian society. Right. So if, if everyone believed libertarianism, then we'd live in that society. At some level, of course, that's true. Right. But that's not what you can get out of a society where you're going to have people that. So Nozick's, you know, third volume, third section of Anarchy, State and Utopia to me is more realistic. Right. Which is that we're going to have, you know, to use old uh, you know, things you'll have in the in the liberal society of the future. You'll have Fonda Vondaville. And Falwellville, right? And so these are references to Jerry Falwell and Jane Fonda. And the question is, as long as we have rules by which they interact with each other, but it, don't expect them in the one to celebrate the other. But as long as they don't coerce the other, then we can have a liberal society. And that image is what I'm trying to to get at, if that makes any sense. Right. And and I think that's I think that's absolutely correct. And so I want to be clear that my argument does not depend upon everybody having some maximal level of goodwill or finding sympathetic joy. And by goodwill, what I mean here, just to clarify, is, is a wanting for others to find happiness, wanting others to have flourishing lives as opposed to ill will, which would be wanting others to suffer, not do very well, not thrive, and so on. And so we can have, you know, you can have goodwill towards someone without agreeing with anything that they're doing. In fact, you could potentially have goodwill to everybody, including your enemies, because you want them, you want them to find happiness in in an, you know, an ethical thriving life as well and see whatever it is that's caused them to be your enemies as kind of preventing them from achieving that. Um, that we don't need a maximal level of that. That's not like a baseline for liberalism to function. Clearly, though, I think it is the case that there needs to be some level of it because if the people are just overwhelmed with ill will towards each other, liberalism, like even toleration will drop away. At that point, you need some degree of it, but it's going to be variable within the society, uh, and and then sympathetic joy is kind of taking that right a step further. It's it's not just me wishing that you, Pete, find happiness. It is actually seeing like taking happiness in the happiness that you have found. So I'm wishing I'm simultaneously wishing that you find even more happiness, but the amount that you've got right now. I find I find joy in, and and that, that I don't think so. I I don't think that that is something that we bake into our political institutions for a lot of reasons. I think for one, the state is a very bad at, as a moral educator. It's you know this is where I think like Aristotle ultimately went wrong in seeing the state as the thing that instills virtues. I think that's just we know from experience. Um, and we have lots of arguments to to back it up that the state is particularly terrible at that. And if you task the state with that, the incentives run to all sorts of really awful places that we don't want to go. Um, but I think that this is something where we have to, because of this this feedback loop of you live right now, even people who even. Patrick Deneens and Adrian Vermeules, who hate liberalism and have written long treatises about why liberalism is evil and ought to be destroyed, they live in a liberal society, even if they wish they didn't, and even if they wish they could change that. Right now, today, they're sitting in a liberal society. And, and so if they want to be happier in it, the person who is just looks out at the world with nothing but ill will is going to be fairly miserable. Um, and and they might want to change it to match change the world to match exactly what they have what would make them they think happy but they can't really do that and so for their own happiness developing more of the goodwill is going to make them more content um, and and this isn't something where everybody needs to raise their level of goodwill but the more basically the more people who have goodwill 
the less likely we are to to backslide, but that this is this is always has to be like an individual pursuit. And I think one of the really interesting things that you brought up was this this notion of harm because that is where like if it were the case that the pride parade was actually inflicting like real harms, you know, in the, like, so it was doing things that were analogous to me punching you in the face, right? We know like a, a liberal, liberal political institutions are allowed to either prevent me from punching you in the face or punish me in some way if I do, or, you know, make me provide you with compensation for the inflicted injury or whatever it happens to be. But we say that that's a kind of harm that a liberal society is allowed to prevent or mitigate. Uh, Where like, and both you and I would agree that the pride parade doesn't inflict harm I mean, it might not like I would say it doesn't inflict harm at all, but we would certainly say it doesn't inflict harm of a degree that would allow the the state to to intervene. And and I think that's where that's where like the real crux for a lot of people are is. And I think this ties into why I think it's particularly valuable to to cultivate this kind of moral perspective of goodwill is because I think for a lot of illiberals, when they look out at the world, they see a whole lot of harm. They see difference as as a form of harm, not just in the sense of like, I'm watching these people in a pride parade and they're doing something that that makes me uncomfortable. You know, like I don't like seeing this kind of behavior, Uh, but also in the sense that they have have a, a, a particular conception of what they want their lives to look like. And and just like in Nozick's Utopia, like you have your conception or utopia of utopias, you have your conception of what you want your life to look like, and you go and find the other people that have that share that conception, and then you build your little utopia together. And if for whatever reason you don't like it anymore, you move to one that better maps onto your conception. There's that social element of it that my ability to lead a good life, unless I'm going to be a hermit out, you know, in a cave somewhere depends upon sharing that with some number of other people who we can, we can live that life together. And, and so one of the things that I increasingly notice is this notion that unless the broader culture represents, either embraces my particular values and preferences, or the people who don't embrace my values and preferences have to kind of keep it on the down low keep it out of the public square and so on, that is a direct assault on my ability to live my life. They, like my life can only be lived the way I want it to be if everybody else is on board with it or at least isn't displaying alternatives to it. And I think that for a lot of people, the inability to do that, so the culture shifting away from you know what they grew up with, so there's more immigrants around who – talk funny and have weird food and celebrate different holidays and dress in odd ways or the decline in you know the number of people who follow my particular religious faith or there's now suddenly people presenting gender in ways that are different than the way that I imagine my own gender to be they view that as an actual harm and and that seems to be the thing that I mean for us liberals that's that's the big problem is not having an argument with someone who is saying, look, I think the state should be able to intervene wherever I want, even when there isn't harm, because I don't think most people actually make that argument. Rather, they say, no, this stuff is is hurting kids. It's destroying our social ties. It's whatever it happens to be like. It's actual harm. Yeah. I mean, obviously, that's where the rubber hits the road. Um, it's always complicated in political legal and and philosophical discussions when you're talking about kids versus adults right and so we basically always work out our theories with adults and but you know people always bring up the kids as their trump uh to say oh but it's harming the kids um and then everyone you know loses their their um you know their minds because you got to protect the kids right um and um so I, there's so much in what you said that I want to sort of step back a minute 
and just stress, you know, a couple things. One of them is, is that I think we can all agree that liberalism has to be liberal and has to exhibit liberality. Um, that's a key aspect of the doctrine. So the idea that you could have illiberal libertarianism to me emerges not so much from the core of the doctrine, but from the sociological phenomena of a minority movement attracting people that would rather uh, be edgelords than actually consistent doctrine. And so I call it litmus test libertarianism, which is that individuals adopt the most obnoxious position possible, that it would be consistent with a non-aggression axiom, and then put a flag in the ground and say, would you agree with this? And if you don't, they want to say, oh, you're not a libertarian, right? Um, and you're like, okay, you know, this is a silly game that you've forced me into playing. And instead, I think, you know, if we look at, you know, you know, not only Macedo's book, but also, you know, Nozick's classic work, but also Chandran Kukathas's, you know, more recently Liberal Archipelago. Mm -hmm. You know, we bite a bullet. We recognize there's going to be some societies that we don't like the way that people organize things, but we want to have the minimum conditions under which we believe that people are living in a non-coercive relationship with others and they can exit. So what's the, the you know, the position of exit that we have and, and whatnot? The second point, so liberalism is liberal. The second point I want to make is that the goal of the social sciences related to this it was has always been to maximize human flourishing while minimizing human suffering. The issue with economics is that's oh that statement is always then, you know, modified by subject to the constraints of nature and you know that's red in tooth and claw and of other human beings, right? Remember, you know, Sartre and no exit, hell is other people, right? And so, you know, we have the constraints of nature and the constraints of other people, but the goal should be to maximize human flourishing and minimize human suffering. And so going back to your goodwill, any curmudgeon that uh or misanthrope that enjoys Others suffering at the expense of that's there where their joy comes from. That individual, you know, threatens the liberal society, right? That that's that's and we should agree on that uh, kind of idea. And so, if we're going to try to have a liberalism that's robust, one of the things that might be necessary if we're going to live in a world with a state, all right, is to be very very clear of the right and wrong of state actions. This is a, a deep question because a lot of these issues are resolved if the state is taken out of it, because then it's just a private matter of your little community doing things rather than the state doing it and having other people involved in it. Um, let me give you an example, which actually makes your case for you. Um, I went to Grove City College. It's a small conservative college in Western Pennsylvania. And many years ago, I won the the Kennedy, the Jack Kennedy Award from them. It's not named after the president. It was an alumni. It's a, it's an alumnus of the year award. And I went to the dinner and the woman in charge of the alumni at the time, there was a debate in Western Pennsylvania about teaching evolution versus creationism in the public schools. And so, you know, I'm sitting down, I'm getting... I'm getting an award. I don't want to have a big debate or anything like that. And this woman starts peppering me. What's my position, you know, on the thing, uh, uh, you know, on this policy debate in Western Pennsylvania? And I say to her, well, this is why I believe that we shouldn't have public schools, because then the parents that wanted their kids to learn creationism could go to, you know, the creation school and the ones who wanted to learn evolution could go to the science school and, you know, blah, 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 blah. She did not like that answer at all. She was like, no, no. She goes, you have to comment on this. And then I just said, probably ill political. I said, listen, here's, here's my position. 
if I am going to go see a doctor, I want to make sure that doctor had been trained in modern science of biology and not in theology. That's the kind of doctor I want to go. And she was like massively pissed off that I was getting this award, right? Like it didn't make any sense to her at all. And I was like, okay, you know, let's, let's try something else for the evening to have a conversation. But I think that I, I, I think that that issue is so important. Think about all the hot button issues, curriculum, all kinds of things like that. A lot of them would go away from the public debate if they were just put into like your choice of your private school that you would go from and your parents and the students would be able to self-select between them. Um, they, they just wouldn't be the kind of political debate that we have. They'd be other debates. They'd be intellectual debates. And at that point, and there would be market tests of what actually, you know, people learn and everything like that. So I would like to push, you know, in that kind of world. But one last thing, which is related to your invoking of Patrick Deneen earlier, there's a great debate in Harper's Magazine uh, earlier this spring on the future of liberalism. And it has Patrick Deneen, Cornell West, Frank Fukuyama, and Deirdre McCloskey. And the only optimistic person in that debate is McCloskey. The rest of them are horribly pessimistic about the future of our society because liberalism is going to fail. And their main argument is that there's not a telos. We need a, they want a telos, right? They want a purpose, an overarching purpose, and they don't want to have a plurality of purposes going on, of pluralism, right? They want to have a multiplicity of purposes being reflected and re respected. And I think that this illiberalism, we have to somehow figure out why it has somehow animated people again um, and, and, and address that. So, you know, intellectuals like you and I, we have to think hard about why it is that populism has risen again on both left and right. Um, kind of populist positions, but a particularly right wing populism is, is particularly illiberal. Um, and so, you know, we have to wonder what's going on there. What might have been the common mistakes that were made that gave oxygen to these kind of odious ideas? Um, and address those. And I think that that's how we're going to end up by having a robust case again for liberalism, which is what we needed this day and age. Yeah. So again, there's a lot. There's a lot to respond to or pick up on and run with in that. Um, I uh, let me take your the the public schools versus like parental choice and private schools thing because this is something that's been on my mind a lot lately as I watch public schools. You know that the pulling of books that have gay characters out of school libraries and the you know the the rules saying that you know teachers can't mention if they're in they can't mention their partner if they're in a same sex relationship and other things like that and some of this has been struck down by courts but there is like a real there's a push um, that the banning of books continues to to go on at a you know at an increasing rate and a lot of libertarians have responded to that kind of thing with the simple this is why we need school choice and that's that's really the only response that they give to basically anti-trans, anti-LGBT in in the schools. And on the one hand, I agree that we should have we should have school choice. We should have you know we should privatizing education is this will upset my progressive listeners, but I think the the arguments for it are quite sound. Uh, but at the same time, I don't know that that should be the only answer we give because one of the arguments that that libertarians and radical liberals have long made about why the government shouldn't be involved in, say, anti-discrimination legislation or shouldn't be involved in social engineering sorts of regulations in the marketplace is that in the absence of state intervention, in, in the state of freedom, there's a marketplace of ideas. The good ideas win out um, that we will get progress. So that, you know, the 
one example of this is the, you know, if in basically the market disincentivizes racist business purveyors, because if you're not willing to hire minorities, um, you're going to end up paying, you know, that it's going to cost you more in labor. You're going to have lower productivity people. Um, if you're not willing to sell to ethnic or religious minorities, you're going to lose business to the people who are and so on. And again, there's like, there's a lot of truth to that. But at the same time, the kind of social progress that we say can happen when the government gets out of the way depends upon the values of the society moving in the direction of progress. And that depends upon calling out those directions that we see as, uh, as bad, as regressive, as dangerous, as immoral, unethical, and so on. And so I think that we can say like, look, yes, we should have school choice, but at the same time, when we don't, there is something wrong, deeply wrong at a moral ethical level with excluding gay identities from acceptability in, you know, in, in even mentioning them in schools or in telling, basically in telling children who have these identities that they, you know, there's something wrong with them and they can't express it. And I think it's in the same, you know, we could say like in an, in a regime of absolute, like perfect school choice, if parents decided to send their kids to a Nazi school that was going to teach them Nazi values, we might not want the state to prevent that. But I think it would be right to say those parents are wrong to do that. They should be criticized, censured, you know, like socially shamed, et cetera. And, and so I think there's often this tendency in, in libertarian circles. And part of this is not wanting to upset potential allies, particularly allies on the right. Um, part of it is seeing basically anything that might smack of the government should do something as as a threat to, you know, anything that might acknowledge there's a problem is a way to kind of invite the government in. Um, but but often we fall back in this like as long as there's choice, whatever flows out of it is is okay or at least shouldn't be commented on. And I think that is a that's a view that I've increasingly coming to reject. Not, not in the sense that I think the government should intervene, but that in the sense that I think we actually have an obligation. If we're saying the government shouldn't intervene, we have an obligation to try to use persuasion, social pressure, et cetera, to argue in favor of more, of more ethical behavior. Yeah, I mean, listen, again, this is an area where um, the, the, the fundamental thrust of what you're saying is something I wholeheartedly agree with. Um, you know, I have family members um, who are, uh, you know, um, LGBTQ, you know, um, and, and were there, you know, uh, a long, long time ago, you know, in, in terms of these things. Uh, my, my mother uh, told me that my uncle was gay. Um, I knew that my uncle was gay probably since I was 12 years old, but my mother told me when I was 18, uh, when, as we were doing something up in that, in the attic and she whispered it to me, she said, you know, you know, your uncle is a homosexual. Like, I, like, yeah, mom, I know. Right. Kind of thing. Um, and so, but, uh, you know, and, and, but he, you know, my uncle lived in New York city. Uh, he unfortunately was in the first generation of individuals that, that died of HIV AIDS and, um, you know, and, and, you know, he was wonderful, man. He asked me to, you know, when he was dying, he asked me, I spoke, I was the one who gave his eulogy um, and everything. And, um, you know, so I, I, you know, and again, I have other cousins and, and everything like that. And I had a cousin just recently who just posted on social media uh, about how difficult it is when people identi uh, uh, deny her existence of her identity. And that this has now, she says, don't talk to me about politics because I'm living in a world now where, you know, the last 25 years, I've thought I've had a march for greater and greater recognition. And now all of a sudden I'm in a world where I'm being denied my, my identity, right? 
And, you know, and you read that and you're like jarring because it goes back to your issue about human suffering versus like, you know, how horrible is that? Right. And so I'm I'm the, but the question, I guess, is the role of the difference between social approbation and disapprobation at an individual level, at a community level, and then what society rules we adopt that do that. Now, you're making a very, very important point, which is that the formal rules of a society are only going to be as resilient as the social attitudes of the population that make it up. And so we have to cultivate in the population enough of a liberal virtues, liberal, right? So to be able to maintain and sustain, because if instead what we have is society that views, you know, other people as objects of hatred or whatever, and, and they're misanthropes, it's going to tear the whole system down. Even if you had a beautiful constitution, it won't be respected, right? And so I think this is a, a kind of a issue. So going back to our school, that's the easy policy answer. It's policy, not politics. Uh, it, you know, if you allow me to say politics in the broader sense, not meaning like electoral politics, but political theory, um, but it's policy to say, oh, school choice. But the reality is, is that, you know, we should be defending the four, you know, the fundamental freedoms, right? And one of those is is the idea that again, you know, against censorship. You know, and 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 one of the key issues is of course that there has to be limits on how much we tolerate intolerance, because there's a paradox of all that, going back to your Nazi kind of thing. But at the same time, when I was a kid, you you know, remember that one of the you you went to law school, so you'll probably know this case. But, you know, it was a big case when the ACLU defended the right of the Nazis to walk a march in Skokie, Illinois, which had the greatest num number of Holocaust survivors. And, you know, that was a quintessential case that was put forth to all of us when I was a kid about what does it mean to really believe in free speech and freedom of assembly? You have to actually, you know, bite the bullet and allow the things that you don't like. But you would hope that we would be able to have social dip disapprobation such that a kid looking on to that doesn't say, man, I want to join that crowd. And instead says, man, if I join that crowd, then I'm not going to have, you know, these kind of opportunities and things like that. And I think that that, you know, is such an important part of, um, you know, our way to have and experience a liberal society is the role that social approbation and disapprobation play. Um, but at the end of the day, um, I, you know, let's take the, the, the banning of books. Did you see the, uh, the HBO little special show on the anarchist in Mexico? It's, it's the, the I couldn't, I could not make myself. I knew that I would just cringe so hard yes, it, it throughout it that I couldn't make myself watch it. It was very cringeworthy. But let me just start with why this is relevant, is that the very first scene is uh, them, a group of people there, burning books. Now, the books are the regulations of the, uh, you know, regulation books, right? And all the things like that. But they're still nevertheless burning books. The symbolism of burning books, even if it's burning state books and, and state regulations, it doesn't matter because the point is you're burning the books. And to me, it's like, how the hell did a group of libertarians get so screwed up in their head that they thought it was OK to adopt that symbolism about how it is that I'm going to bring the system down? Now, you know, if you're an anarcho-capitalist, anarcho of course, you want to bring the system down, right? I mean, that's that's part of the issue, right? But that doesn't mean that every, t every way that you bring the system down is the right way to bring it down, right? And so intolerance and sort of adopting stormtrooper type, you know, strategies is not the way to get to a free society. It's the way to get to an illiberal society. And so we should never be banning books. We should be defending the right of the, uh, you know, the books to exist on the shelf. And we shouldn't be putting librarian in a position where, you know, they can be, uh, you know, sued by parents or whatever, you know, like it, 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 it's just, you know, not the case. And so I agree that we should be defending the principle as opposed to just the policy and like the quick answer. Oh, get rid of, you know, the public schools or the public libraries, and then all this will go away. You know, that's like a Jedi mind trick, you know, like, and, and we live in a world where we have a state, we live in a world where we have public institutions. The question is, what are the rules that allow us to live better together 
within those public institutions. And I would argue freedom of, you know, freedom of speech, freedom of association, freedom of contract, all these kind of freedoms that follow out of the classical liberal tradition and have been radicalized, let's say, by radical libertarianism, uh, they should be our first principles that we defend and not any kind of intolerance, uh, you know, of, of, of ideas or, or anything like that, precisely because of the marketplace of ideas that you were talking about. And that the greatest disinfected is, you know, sunlight and exposure of these ideas. Um, but part of that exposure is approbation and disapprobation. So it, you can't have a rule of tolerance, which doesn't allow judgment. So this might be an issue again, right? Which is that if I have a principle of toleration, it doesn't mean that I can't also pass judgment on, you know, oh, I tolerate that person for believing X, Y, and Z, but I think X, Y, and Z is a horrible belief system and you shouldn't hold it is a different kind of argument. It's just that I don't have the right to impose that objection to your system on you. I have the responsibility maybe of trying to persuade you that it's not the right way to think about it. Um, but yeah, so I, again, I think that, uh, you know, the advertisement of our, of our disagreement is much, is, 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 is out of proportion to actually where it is. It's an intramural battle within a, a particular thing. I just want the thinnest commitment possible that would allow for liberalism as opposed to a thicker notion, but I recognize that the sustainability of a liberal system actually would require that the population become thicker in its appreciation for these things. And so you would hope that we would, in fact, you know, again, embrace human diversity and embrace the idea of the autonomy of individuals. And I like the way that you put it a lot, actually, which is to um, find joy in others pursuing their projects and finding meaning in their lives. I, my oldest son is a musician, okay? And uh, he's a super smart kid. If it was up to me, and I tried many, many times, I will tell you this, uh, I tried to tell him his best life would have been to go and become a professor, and in fact, become a musicologist. And I'm fortunate enough in my life that, and my wife are fortunate enough in our life that we would have sponsored our son to become a musicologist and, you know, be a professor at some place and study that. And he could have got, he tell, he's a great storyteller. He's wonderful. He knows everything about the history of music. And, you know, as I, well, you know, he didn't pursue that. Instead, he pursued being a punk musician himself, having a, you know, a punk music store up in Brooklyn, New York, living basically in a communal living space for, you know, forever. And eventually I just got to a point of view where it's like, well, you know, Matthew's living his life as he wants to live it. It's not the life I would have chose, but it's the life he's chosen for himself. And now, you know, he has now found another avenue in which his music world is opening up for him and he's he's very much he's thriving and everything like that and i take tremendous joy in looking at the man that he's become and the way that he's pursued all of that and i think that that you know obviously he's my son so i have a particular tie to it but i think of that in general you know of of people finding their way it's not the way i would want to live right it's 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 a totally unconventional lifestyle the way he lives and everything like that but He's found happiness and, and meaning and purpose in his life. And you know what? That's awesome. And, um, you know, I, I think that we should, I agree with you that, that if that's what you mean by uh, joyous celebration, I, I, I agree with that. Yeah. Thank you for listening to Reimagining Liberty. If you like the show and want to support it, head to reimaginingliberty.com to learn more. You'll get early access to all my essays, as well as be able to join the Reimagining Liberty Discord community and book club. That's reimaginingliberty.com, or look for the link in the show notes. Talk to you soon.